scripture passage this morning comes from Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 20. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears a bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you only through Christ. Christ alone. We can't come to you without a mediator because of our sin and because of your holiness, but in your grace and in your mercy and in your infinite kindness, you've provided what we need. The perfect mediator who has his arms wide open to any and all who would come to him by faith. And so here we are, yours brought near by the blood of Christ, and we're thankful. And God, I pray that that common confession would bind us together, that we would increasingly love one another, that we would continually look for opportunities to give of self to build up this church. Would you increase our affection for the body of Christ? And God, we do pray for the students this week that are going to camp, that it would be a very fruitful time. Pray that as they're away from normal life and as they are really immersed by your word, that it would be a special week, a trajectory setting week, a priority setting week and that they would come back renewed and with a fresh commitment not just to look forward to camp the next year but to live for you the other 360 days of the year. God we rejoice with Cody and Carolyn Bingham in the birth of Natalie. We're thankful for a healthy baby and for a healthy mom and we pray that you'd be with them even now. Encourage them and pray that they would adjust well to life with yet another newborn life with lots of littles, give them perseverance and endurance and encouragement. And we pray for little Natalie in her heart that she would just grow up knowing you and loving you and, and never remembering a day where Jesus Christ wasn't her treasure and her king and the Lord of her life. God, we pray for Lindsay and Samuel and their time in the States that it would be a time of encouragement and refreshment and rest, but also that what they need in terms of support, both prayer and financial, would be taken care of. And I pray that we would be able to encourage them as well as one of their supporting churches. Pray that they would continue to grow in their new marriage, that they would faithfully embody the gospel, that they would be a faithful reflection of Christ and the church. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but your word stands forever. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. I mentioned uh, a few weeks ago, I was able to take the family to the Smoky Mountains. And if you know any, anything about that part of the country, we had to go through Memphis where we were going. And we were actually going to stay in Memphis. And so we left right after service that particular Sunday and we're going and Probably a good hour out, we start seeing signs, I-40 bridge, out. And uh, not being super familiar with the area, didn't think a lot about it. And then we would see them ever so often, signs. Like, okay, well, let's look into this. And by the time we looked into it, it was a bit too late to reroute. It would have cost us a couple hours. So here we are. And if you know anything about it, there's really two main ways to cross the river in Memphis. And I-40 is the main way. I don't know what it was doing out in June, but there we go. And so we have to take I-55 And we get there and we are 2.8 miles from our exit. It's 1130 at night. We've been driving for 11 hours with five kids. And there was a car on fire on the bridge. The only bridge. So we sat there. Thankfully, the map said it would be a couple hours. Thankfully, it was just about an hour. And we made it across. We were stuck. Praise God. In life, we're not stuck with one way. 
We have a choice, but the choice we make, the path we take, it will determine our future. In fact, it will determine our forever future. This morning's passage is a warning about two ways. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. And praise God, there's an escape and an invitation to avoid the wrong way. We are in the Sermon on the Mount. If you've got a Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, grab one of our Bibles there in the chairs, and it's page 762 as Jesus begins to conclude the greatest sermon ever preached. Matthew 7, 13 and following, and Jesus is landing his plane now. He's concluding his sermon, and he's calling for a response. Here he is. He's finished his discourse on discipleship, and now he's going to give us in the rest of chapter 7 four sketches, all really iterating the importance of of responding rightly to his teaching and the consequences of not responding rightly to his teaching. And friends, the consequences could not be more serious. Let's just look at where he's going to land us. Look at verse 13. The easy way leads to destruction. Look at verse 19. The tree that doesn't bear good fruits, it's cut down and thrown into the fire. Look at verse 23. Jesus will declare, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And then the last verse of the sermon, verse 27. The house fell and great was the fall of it. These are images for final judgment. The consequence is eternal judgment. And so we must heed the king. So let's consider two points this morning. First, a command to enter by the narrow gate. And then second, a warning to beware of false prophets. So first, a command to enter by the narrow gate. Look with me again in verses 13 and 14. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate for because the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few in these verses Jesus he's laying out two ways the narrow gate and the wide gate and this sort of laying out of two ways actually happens several times in scripture prophet Jeremiah says this and to this people you shall say thus says the Lord behold I set before you the way of life in the way of death. In the book of Deuteronomy, the very end, so after Moses laid down the law, he has a similar invitation and a warning. Let me read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord your God, the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob to give to them. Two ways, life and death, choose life. It's an invitation and it's a warning. Chris read for us Psalm 1. It's one of my favorite visions of the two ways. And you have the way of the righteous man and the way of the wicked man. And the way of the wise man, the righteous man is blessed. And why? It's because he meditates on the law and he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. He's focused on the Lord. And, and notice how it described in remember verse 3. He's like a tree. He's a fruitful tree. He's got a fruitful life. Not so the wicked. Instead, they're like chaff that the wind drives away they're the opposite of a fruitful tree two ways to live one of my favorite gospel tracks 
It's called Two Ways to Live. And here Jesus lays out the two ways and he gives us a command and then he gives some reasoning behind the command and the command is enter by the narrow gates. Well, what's the narrow gate? Well, remember the context here in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the way of Jesus. It's what he's been laying down for three chapters. Both John the Baptist in chapter 3, verse 2, and then Jesus in chapter 4, 17, they come and they preach the same message. And what's the message? The kingdom is coming. The king is here. And so what's our response? Repent. Turn from our way and turn to the Lord. Turn from sin and turn to the Lord. Reorient. Drop our agenda and take upon his agenda. And so the narrow gate is the way of the kingdom. It's the way of repentance. It's the way that acknowledges and seeks to submit to the rule of King Jesus. It's the narrow way. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate. Follow me. Why? Because the alternative, the other way, the other road, the road to destruction is wide and it's easy and many take that path. So Jesus here, he's warning us of the consequences of not following him, not submitting to him. He says it will lead to destruction. The broad gate will. Well, what's the broad gate? It's the way of the world. It's the way of the self. And remember again, the context, who's one of Jesus' main antagonists? It's the way of the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Remember what he said in chapter 5, verse 20 to his disciples? I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. He was after this heart righteousness this heart for God. And so if we're just like the Pharisees or scribes and we're able to check some things off and we know some things and we look okay externally, but we don't have a heart that's been changed, a heart for God, we're part of the broad way. External conformity to rules without heart change is part of the broad gate as well. And notice what Jesus says about these two gates. He says the narrow gate, it's hard. Why is it hard? Well, because it's hard to deny ourselves, isn't it? Our natural inclination is to exalt the self. We, in our fallen inclination, we want to be king of our own lives. We want to rule ourselves. We don't want Christ as king. And so to dethrone the self and enthrone Jesus is hard in this fallen world. But that's the call of Christ. The call to discipleship is a costly call. Let me read some passages from the Gospel of Luke from Jesus about how hard this call is. Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself a little bit later in Luke 9 Jesus continues this hard teaching in verse 57 as they were going along the road someone said to him I'll follow you wherever you go and Jesus said to him foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head to another he said follow me but he said Lord let me first go and bury my father and Jesus said to him leave the dead to bury their own dead but as for you go and proclaim the kingdom of God and yet another said I'll follow you Lord but let me first say farewell to those at my home and Jesus said to him no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God it's a costly call. A couple chapters later in Luke 14, Jesus expounds it a bit more. Verse 25, now great crowds accompanied him. Got a lot of people here. He's got a lot of audience. What's he going to say? He turns and he says to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, he's not saying literally hate your family, but he's saying our love for the Lord, our love for him ought to be so much different, so much superior that our love for others seems that way. 
Verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross, and remember what the cross is, the cross is an instrument of execution. Whoever doesn't die daily and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus says, Come to me, follow me. But then he tells you, well, first, you better count the cost. You better realize how hard this life is. You know, we often do the opposite, don't we? We're trying to get people to follow the Lord. We try to make it as easy as possible. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Heaven forbid someone might see that you actually want to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus says, you better take account of your life and see if you're ready. It's hard. Following Jesus is hard. You know, as we share the gospel with people, we need to be real about that. The call to Christ is a call to come and die. It's hard to die to self every day. And it's hard to go against culture. The pressure is just mounting. Which is why Jesus says, few there be that find it. Again, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has asked, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. The narrow gate is hard, Jesus says, but it leads to life. Don't you want life? Life abundant here and life eternal, meaningful life here and forever life hereafter. It's hard, but it's worth it. Jesus says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Have it abundantly. The narrow gate is hard. The way of Jesus is hard, but it's absolutely worth it. Which makes sense with our own experience, right? Most things worth doing do not come easy. He says, the narrow gate's hard. He says, the wide gate's easy. Look again at what he says there, Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. This broad way, it's easy. It doesn't, it doesn't ask much of you. There's no call to deny yourself on the broad road. It blends right in with the world. It's just YOLO. You only live once. You be you. You do you. It's the path of least resistance. Doesn't really think about the future. Does, certainly doesn't think about eternity. Just focus on the right now. Right here, right now. Instant gratification. If it feels good, do it. Follow your heart. Wide gate is easy. So, Jesus says, those who enter by it are Many. Few find the hard way that leads to life, but many enter by the easy way. The majority will not follow Jesus and find life. These are sobering words. The people of God have always been a remnant, always been a minority. The way of the multitudes is almost always wrong. The philosopher Kierkegaard was right. The more people, the less truth. So Jesus warns us about following the crowd. And so it should cause us to ask, are we following the crowd? Or are there areas in in our lives that are difficult because we follow Jesus, because we believe God's word? As Christians, we can't go with the flow. Jesus is warning that to go with the flow leads to destruction. And so we must resist. We must swim against the stream. We can't just drift with the crowd. Jesus says the drifting leads to destruction. I remember I was, I was probably five years old or so, and we were at this, we were at the lake, we were at a boat dock, so we're there, and the, the boat's in the slip, and my little brother's probably two or so, and we're leaning on the boat, not realizing we're drifting. You know, my arms were a little bit longer, 
So Meyer, I could, I could hang on while his little short two-year-old arms weren't. And so he falls in. It's just me and him at first. My mom has to come scramble and reaching around for him, finally grabs him up by his hair. <laughs> Didn't even realize that he was drifting. The drift is slow. The drift is often unnoticeable. You're just enjoying the stream, canoeing along without resistance, not even realizing there's a cliff awaiting you. The narrow gate's hard, few find it, but it leads to life. The wide gate is easy, many follow it, and it leads to destruction. This, is, this should put a little bit of fear in us. This is scary, hard teaching. Jesus' words ought to cause us all to ask, which road am I on? Which path am I on? Because I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe you haven't trusted Jesus, and that's the call is to trust him. That's the first step to getting on this narrow road that's hard but leads to life and is therefore worth it. And so if you haven't done that, let me just exhort you, look to Christ. Trust in him. The gospel is God's sin, Christ's response. God is our triune loving creator, but he's also holy and our sin has separated us from God, but God in love hasn't left us in our sin. He sent Jesus Christ to live a perfect life and die in our place and be raised from the dead and exalted at the right hand. And now what's our response? It's faith and repentance. Maybe that's your first step. We talk about responding in a few ways. A, B, C, admit, believe, confess. Admit you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus and confess him publicly and then obey in baptism. Or sorry, thanks, and please. God, I'm sorry I've sinned against you. Thank you for sending your son. Would you please forgive me? Maybe that's your first step. If you have questions about becoming a Christian, there's nothing we enjoy talking about more would ask all of you are you following him you know Abilene's filled with a lot of people we might call them lukewarm Christians we'll say a lot more about them next week people who say they're Christians but they're actually on the broad road and so a simple way to ask to know is just to ask ourselves in our own lives who's on the throne Am I on the throne or is King Jesus on the throne? Who is actually ruling my life? Who's the authority? And so as we go about our daily life, does the rule of Jesus through his word, does it play any role? Who's king in your life? If you're the only determiner, if you are ruling your life apart from Christ and his word, you're on the broad road, but Jesus invites you to the narrow road so this is serious we've got to be awake we got to remain watchful and vigilant staying our course on the narrow road and at least one way to do that is to beware of false teachers which is our second point a warning to beware of false teachers in chapter 7 verse 15 Jesus says beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves watch out for people who would lead you off the road later in this gospel Jesus is going to say if the blind lead the blind what will happen well both will fall into a pit and so beware this is a warning for Jesus from Jesus for us beware be aware be on guard be watchful because they come in and they come in looking like one of us listen to the way Peter put it very similar but false prophets also rose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought, bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. You know, when we think about false prophets, I wonder what imagery comes to your mind. False prophet. What do you think of? Hitler? I think of like Al Pacino. Or even if you're a college basketball person, Rick Pitino. 
If you look at Rick Pitino, you're like, there's more going on. Something happening under the table <laughs> with Rick Pitino. He just looks like he's got a little side hustle in the mafia. I remember in 2013 when Louisville won, so he's the coach. U of L wins, and he's walking to shake the coach's hand, and so the game's over, and they have fireworks and stuff come down. He's like, he's, he's ducking. I'm like, he's just used to dodging bullets. That's why. <laughs> think of Al Pacino, Rick Pitino. You think of this guy. The dark three-piece suit, you know, with a pointed tail hanging out the back. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. They look like sheep. They look acceptable. They're funny. They're kind. They're charming. They're very nice. You know, I know some, I know some liberal Bible professors that undermine the scriptures at every turn, deny all kinds of key tenets of the Christian faith. Some of the nicest, kindest, gentlest people you'll ever meet in their teaching is sending people to hell every semester. They may sit back and they may appear humble and they may make statements like, well, you know, we just, we just can't know. And they'll often do that. They'll often teach in the form of questions. Well, we, we really just, we can't say that Jesus is the only way. I mean, there's a lot of well-intentioned and good people out in the world. There's a lot of good religions. Well, the Bible really can't be inerrant because it was written by men. Well, homosexuality is not, not a sin because now we know and just look at all the experience of all the people. Well, substitutionary atonement, it can't be true because it paints God as a God of wrath and that just can't be right. Well, judgment can't be true, right? Because we know God is a God of love. And they try to give false assurance. Listen, friends, it's nothing new. They were doing it in Jeremiah's day. Jeremiah 6, for from the least to the greatest of them, everyone's greedy for unjust gain and from prophet to priest, Everyone deals falsely. They've healed the wound of my people lightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. False prophets have always been around and they always will be around and they come in like sheep. They're subtle. They're funny. They're like late night TV hosts. They're like the attractive and compelling person on TikTok. The really sweet teacher who teaches evolution. The soft-spoken and gentle introverted textbook writer who advocates for relativism and dismisses the Bible. Listen to the way Paul warns in 2 Corinthians 11. Such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. They look like sheep, Jesus says, but what does he say they are inwardly? Ravenous wolves. What do wolves want to do? They want to eat you. They want to devour you. They may say, well, I just want to round you out or I just want to enlighten you. I just want to broaden your horizons. I just want to help you think critically about the faith. Jesus says, no, they are ravenous and they want to destroy you. In Acts chapter 20, we have a beautiful picture of the Apostle Paul. He had been in Ephesus and he's, he's leaving town. And here he's telling, basically he's telling the elders goodbye. And I want to read just a few verses from Acts 20, verse 26. What's the Apostle Paul going to leave him with? He says, therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pastors, elders, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, elders, not sparing the flock. Ideas are destructive. False teaching is dreadfully serious. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. 
It's one of the main jobs of the elders to protect the teaching of the church, and we take it dreadfully serious here. I tell friends we're like theological snobs. It's just a fun, trying to be funny and lighthearted a way of saying we're really serious about the teaching of this church because of verses like these. But you know what? The call's not just to the elders, it's to you too. Warning after warning. You know, there's 27 books in the New Testament. In 25 of 27 books, there's a warning to beware of false teaching. Teaching is so important. Jesus tells us here in the Sermon on the Mount, we must beware. We must be aware. We must look out. We must pay attention. We must be on guard. And the best way to be on guard for false doctrine is to be versed in sound doctrine. Today, it's just we're so illiterate. Way too many Christians have hardly any knowledge of historic Christian doctrine. Southside, let's be different. Let's be versed. Let's be stable and secure. In fact, one of my favorite church passages, church books, is the book of Ephesians. And so you have chapter one, who we were. Chapter two, he made us one new man. Chapter three, Paul talks about his ministry a little bit. Chapter four, how we keep the unity. And then at the end of chapter four, it says that the ascended Christ, the, the victorious Christ who's been raised, has gifted the church with gifts. And what are those gifts? It's leadership. This is Ephesians 4, 12 to 16. What's the purpose of that leadership? It's to equip the saints for the work of ministry. It's not for the leaders to do the ministry, it's to equip the church, equip the saints for the work of ministry so that we would then speak the truth in love and build one another up. And notice what he says, he says in Ephesians 4.14, here's one of the purposes. So that, that's that purpose statement, so that what? We may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful Schemes. We want to be a church grounded in sound doctrine, stable and secure. So he warns us, but then Jesus tells us how to recognize them. Look at verse 16. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. See, the fruit that these false teachers produce, it will show who they are. It will show their true nature. The results their lives produce will betray them. It'll show their true color. Like fake gold, it'll eventually betray its true nature by turning your skin green. Their fruit will betray them. They're false. The nature of the tree determines the fruit. That's what he's saying here. Thorn bushes, they don't make grapes. Mesquite trees do not produce bananas, though that would be awesome. He says a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. And a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. And so if we've trusted in Christ, we've been regenerated, made new. We have a new nature. If anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation. Colossians 3, we've put off the old self. We've put on the new self. And so if we've trusted Christ, we're a Christian, there should be good fruit. Your life should be changing, however imperfectly, however slowly, sometimes painfully so. But when we have the Spirit, He changes us. He produces fruit in us. The fruit that the Spirit produces. Things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we have the Spirit, we've been made new, then He will begin to change us from the inside out, from one degree of glory to another. And again, remember, this is what the scribes and Pharisees were missing they didn't have this heart righteousness. They didn't have the spirit. This is what they needed so bad. That's why Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs. They look really good on the outside. They kept a lot of the external rules, but inside they were rotting bones. External conformity. And this is where the Sermon on the Mount gets in our grill. External conformity alone is not enough. Jesus wants your heart. External conformity is insufficient. It'll never produce true fruit. Paul Tripp, in one of his books, gives the analogy. His wife really wanted an apple tree, and he lives in Pennsylvania, and he tried everything he could do. He just couldn't get anything to grow and last. And uh, out of frustration, finally, 
And she asked about it, and he's just filled with pride. And so he finally goes to the grocery store and buys a bushel of apples, and he goes and he nails them to the tree. <laughs> Soon enough, the nature of the tree is going to show bad fruits, going to show that it cannot produce good fruits. But if we have the Spirit of God, he becomes noticeable in our lives. Thankfully, we have pretty mild winters here. But in the dead of winter, you can often tell which homes are vacant and which homes are occupied because the vacant will be covered in snow. But those that are occupied, you'll see the shingles because the warmth of the house will melt the snow. The Spirit makes his presence known through life change, through good fruit. True faith will issue in changed behavior. Good trees bear good fruits. Remember the parable of the soils? We call it the parable of the sower. It's really the parable of the four, four soils. We'll get there in Matthew chapter 13. How do we know which soil was good? Very simply, it produces fruit. Some 30 and some 60 and some 100 folds. So Jesus warns us, beware false prophets. So what are some ways that we can safeguard against false teaching? Let me close with four. Number one is probably the easiest, and that's just to pray for the church. There's a lot of churches compromising in our day, and as the cultural pressure rises, I think we'll see even more. And notice that these warnings are from among you. You know, I don't get real bothered by the, the culture's teaching. I expect it to be bad. I do get bothered when we see churches compromise. But here's the warning. It will come from among you. And so what can you do? Pray for the church to stay pure. Pray for the leadership of the church to stay pure. I wonder if this is part of your prayer life. God, would you preserve the teaching of Southside Baptist Church? As you pray through the membership directory, pray that we would remain stable and secure. And I assure you, we are doing everything we can to, to make that the case, to keep it pure. Again, we are quite diligent to do that, but we could always use your prayers. Let me read from Colossians 1. This is a prayer of the Apostle Paul for the local church at Colossae. Notice what he prays. So from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you. What's he praying? He's asking that the church may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Praying filled with knowledge. You don't know how to pray for church members? Pray this. I pray that they'd be filled with the knowledge of God's will. In all spiritual wisdom, God, would you make this church a, a church filled with wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work? Would they be transformed? Would they be obedient? And then he mentions it again, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Knowledge matters, and prayer to that end matters. So pray first. Second, know the word. Be a, be a person of the book. Regularly study the Bible. J.C. Ryle says, it's the neglect of the Bible which makes so many a prey to the first false teacher whom they hear. So be grounded in scripture. Be reading and memorizing and meditating. We do this plan together called F260. Y'all remember that? Many of you started and you've fallen off. You know what? That's okay. Jump back in. In fact, we're about to start the New Testament. It'd be a great time. You can Google it, F260. We, uh, I think there's probably some physical copies out here. It's in our weekly email. If you haven't signed up for that, sign up. You can put it in there. Jump in with us. It's so easy. It's, it's two chapters a day, five days a week. You can easily jump in and finish on. Get a plan. If you, if you fail to plan, you'll plan to fail. Jump in with us. Read the word. Listen to 1 John chapter 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. Speaking of false teachers, you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever's not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. What is the spirit of error? What's he saying here? Those who are truly from God, they listen to them. Who's that? The apostles. For us, that's the New Testament. It's the whole Bible. How do we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error? The word. We listen and do the word. Second, number three. If you're not a member here, and I know there's a lot of new faces, let me encourage you to find a church that's committed to expositional preaching. If you want to learn more about us, 
Nathan mentioned we have a class this Saturday, 9 to noon. Please sign up today if you're interested, and you'll learn all you want to learn about us joining our church. There are a few others in town, but this method of preaching is, uh, there's a famine in the land. Expositional preaching is just preaching where the point of the sermon is the point of the passage. It's the old way. It's the historic way. And so what you've seen me do is just talk about Matthew 7, 13 to 20 for 30 minutes. Next week, we're going to talk about Matthew 7, 21 to 23 for 30, 40 minutes, on and on and on, so that God is setting the agenda for his church. It's an easy way to avoid false teaching is just open up the book and talk about it. Let Christ rule his church through his word, and this is the way he rules. Christ exercises his scepter through the written word. So join us or find a church that is committed to teaching the Bible. And then fourth and finally, read some good theology. Some of you aren't readers. A lot of, a lot of people aren't readers anymore. Let me just challenge you. Set a goal. Set a goal to read a book or two this year. Get a D group. Walk through some theology. We've got on our website, ssbaptist.org, we've got a bunch of resources of really good, often short theology books. And so let, let wise teachers through the book inform you about good theology. Let me recommend just three classics, kind of modern day classics. None of these are easy, but again, you'll grow into it. Number one, John Piper, Desiring God. Fantastic modern day, basically book on the Christian life but doctrinally informed. Piper, desiring God. Number two, J.I. Packer, knowing God. Devotional theology at its best. Number three, R.C. Sproul, the holiness of God. Desiring God, knowing God, holiness of God. Read some good books. We also invite you to make Sunday school great again. This summer... This summer at 9 a.m., everyone's invited to come over in the college room and learn systematic theology. I think for like four or five weeks in, I can't remember, I think it's got six weeks more, more something like that. John Reed, one of our elders, taught on sin this morning. Uh, I don't even remember who's teaching the next topic the next morning, but come. If you're not in the class, join us. 9 a.m., college room. Learn some theology. Pray, know the word, join a Bible teaching church that's grounded in theology and read some good theology. Church, let's heed the call of the king. Enter by the narrow gates and beware of false prophets. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word, your word incarnate and your word written. Your word incarnate, your son teaches us the good life. And oh, how kind it is that we have an invitation and a warning. You haven't left us to ourselves. You've given us two ways right before us, and you've shown us the consequences of each way. And so, God, would we joyfully choose the narrow way, even though it's hard, we know it leads to life. Would we be those characterized by glad submission to the King of Kings, knowing that although it's hard, it's infinitely worth it. If there's anyone here under the sound of my voice that doesn't know Jesus, I pray that you would show them the end for which they're living. Show them the consequences. Show them that ultimately it's, it's bankrupt in this life, but even more importantly, it leads to destruction eternally. May they flee to Christ. May those of us who know you respond rightly right now in strong singing, but also in daily lives of faithfulness. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.